is Dr. Gauri Gupta Sharma. I am an endocrinologist by profession. Today, I would like to shed some light on an endocrine cancer which is relatively rare but is quite extensive known as carcinoid tumors or neuroendocrine tumors or BNETs. BNETs is basically one of the most extensive tumors. So, I'll be delivering a bird's eye view regarding its symptomatology, diagnosis and treatment for your own ease with our main focus being on its symptomatology. So if I talk in simple terms, all the tumors, neoplasms or cancers are basically uncontrolled growth and multiplication of a particular type of cell in the body. Likewise, nets are a consequence of uncontrolled neoplastic proliferation of enterochromaffin cells which despite being ubiquitous in distribution are most predominantly located in bronchial epithelium means the lungs, the gastrointestinal tract means the stomach and the intestines and the urogenital tract means urinary and reproductive system. Their main feature is synthesis, storage and secretion of serotonin which mediates the major impact of nets on the body along with the other bioactive substances that include histamine, dopamine, substance P, neurotensin, prostaglandins, calicarins, tachykinins and certain hormones like ACTH and CRF. So owing to the ubiquitous distribution and secretion of bioactive substances, the symptoms of the nets depends upon three things majorly. Number one, the site of occurrence. Number two, the local and the distance spread. Number three, production of hormones and other bioactive substances that we have already discussed. So, uh, one of the most uh, prominent feature of NETS is the carcinoid syndrome. Uh, it most commonly occurs in uh, lung NETS and NETS pertaining to small intestines and proximal colon. So, what are the major features of NET? Number one is the flushing. Flushing basically affects the area of head and neck. Majority of time, it manifests as an upper body swelling, a rash, unpleasant warm feeling and itching associated with sweating and palpitation. It may be spontaneous and most probably sometimes may get precipitated by infections, spicy meals, alcohol, mental or physical exhaustion and certain drugs like catecholamine injections, calcium injections or pengastrin injections. Another prominent feature of carcinoid syndrome is the diarrhea which is debilitating in nature it is secretory that means it tends to persist with fasting and stools may be watery, frothy or bulky in nature. Third prominent feature is the bronchoconstriction which presents with asthma like symptoms that includes wheezing and dyspnea. Right sided heart failure may present as swelling of feet, fatigue, weakness, abdominal swelling, cough, dyspnea and wheeze. Another feature is elevated urinary 5-HIAA which is 5-hydroxy indole acetic acid a major metabolite of serotonin. Now other features less common features of carcinoid syndrome includes weight loss, sweating and pellagra like lesions. So all these symptoms may be present in various combination with flushing and diarrhea being the commonest. Carcinoid syndrome is rare in midgut nets with small tumor burden and doesn't at all occur in rectal nets. Occasionally, carcinoid syndrome may precipitate into carcinoid crisis which may be life-threatening and is characterized by severe flushing, diarrhea, hypotension, hypothermia and tachycardia. It mostly occurs spontaneously or may occur during induction of anesthesia, chemotherapy or infection. Now let's talk about organ specific features of the nets. First, we talk about the lung nets. They can be asymptomatic or may be an incidental diagnosis on chest radiography. When symptomatic, the symptoms may include carcinoid syndrome, the features of which have already been discussed, and Cushing syndrome, owing to ACTH or CRH secretion. 
Other non-specific symptoms include cough, hemopsis, dyspnea, chest pain, wheezing, pneumonitis, basically symptoms mimicking asthma. Now talking about midgut nets, that is small intestine nets. They basically present as vague and periodic abdominal pain and bowel obstruction. Talking about hindgut or large intestine nets which present as obstruction or rectal bleeding. Gastrinomas, also known as zollinger ellison syndrome, may present as aggressive peptic ulcer. As we can see, the symptomatology of NETS can be varying and overlapping with other medical conditions, which renders a diagnostic delay of somewhere between 2 to 3 years in this condition, which is fairly common. Now let's continue with the other organ-specific symptoms. Insulinomas. They include hypoglycemic symptoms, especially post-fasting and exercises. 85% of the population presents with diplopia, blurred vision, palpitations and weakness. Talking about glucaganomas, they are rare entities and their characteristic feature includes the enemy that is necrolytic migratory arrhythmias and diabetes. Enemy is basically a phlogistic damage to the tissue areas exposed to friction and pressure. Other features include chronic diarrhea, weight loss, thromboembolic features like deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, glossitis, stomatitis, chelitis, and neuropsychiatric manifestations which may include depression, insomnia, dementia, psychosis, agitation, delusions, ataxia, and so on. Now let's talk about the diagnosis. The nets, or as a matter of fact, most of the other endocrine disorders have a set protocol for diagnosis, for which the first step is the biochemical diagnosis. The biochemical diagnosis basically means detection of certain enzymes or metabolites or so many other disease-specific substances in secretions of body like blood or urine. The second step includes anatomical localization, which includes radiographical imaging like CT, and MRI. The third step includes functional imaging that is the test that reveals or detects or measures the activity of the tumor. This includes radio enabled diagnostic imaging with somatostatin analogs. The functional imaging basically has complementary role in tumor localization along with the CT or an MRI. Now talking about the diagnostic part in little bit detail. First is a biochemical diagnosis. Whenever carcinoid tumor or carcinoid syndrome is suspected in a patient, the first step is to test for 24-hour urinary 5-HIAA and serum chromogranin A levels. If I talk specifically about insulinoma, if we suspect insulinoma specifically, a supervised 72 hours fasting test is conducted which includes measurement of plasma glucose, proinsulin, insulin and C-peptide at certain levels. When glucagonoma is suspected, the glucagon levels above 1000 picogram per ml by radioimmune assay is the diagnostic. If gastrinomas are suspected, elevated gastrin levels post intravenous secretory administration is diagnostic. Now over to anatomical localization. In cases of lung nets or midgut nets, the modality of choice is a CT scan, helical, contrast enhanced, and triple face CT scan of abdomen and pelvis are conducted in cases of midgut nets. In cases of hepatic spread, a contrast enhanced MRI is the modality of choice. In cases where metastasis have already occurred and primary is unknown, upper and lower gastrointestinal endoscopy is conducted which has an additional advantage of being able to conduct a biopsy too. The options of functional imaging are very much subjected to availability and financial constraints. Nevertheless, the choices include scintigraphy. It may be either somatostatin receptor scintigraphy, commonly known as the octatide scan, or MIBG scintigraphy. 
It basically allows whole body imaging and can assist in identifying an otherwise occult primary site. If available, PET CT, particularly 18 FDG PET, has a greater sensitivity for functional imaging. Now let's talk about the treatment part. Surgical resection is the mainstay of the management, not only in localized disease, but also in cases of advanced disease. Depending upon various factors like tumor grade, symptoms, performance status, and organ functions. Now the question arises, if or what is the utility of medical management? The class of drugs known as the SSAs, somatostatin analogs, basically block the release of bioactive substances from the tumor, thus is the mainstay for the control of symptoms of carcinoid syndrome. This class of drug is generally well tolerated and have mild adverse effects that very rarely require discontinuation of the drugs. The common side effects include nausea, abdominal pain, diarrhea, bloating and fat malabsorption. Over time, mild glucose intolerance and asymptomatic gallstone or sludge may develop. Periodic monitoring of blood sugar levels, annual thyroid function tests, vitamin B12 levels and vitamin D level monitoring are advised. So are there any other options for the management? The answer is only for the advanced disease. That is, if your disease has already spread and surgical resection is practically of no use. The options include EBRT, that is external beam radiation therapy, wherein radiation is used from an external source for the treatment, PRRT, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, which is a site targeted therapy to deliver cytotoxic levels of radiation dose to the cancer cells. The conventional chemotherapy, the cytotoxic drugs basically of various regimens including cisplatin, etoposide or streptozotocin regimens may be used. In nutshell, the treatment is a shared decision between your endocrinologist, your oncologist and your endocrine surgeon. I hope this video finds you in best of health. If it doesn't, please do get yourself evaluated from your general physician at the very least, if not your endocrinologist. Thank you for watching.